Okay, so thanks for coming. Uh, we're really excited this week to have Becky Dawson visiting. Uh, she's done some fantastic work in orbital mechanics, both for exoplanets and with the outer solar system and the early evolution of the solar system, looking at the Kuiper Belt. Uh, she did grad school at Harvard with Ruth Mary Clay, who was here a couple months ago for Planet Day, and uh, is now a Miller Fellow at Berkeley, who works with Eugene Chang, who's also here recently, and uh, just got a faculty job at Penn State. So uh, I'm very excited to do this. To see Thanks very much. Um, oh, you're <laughs> closing already. Wow. Okay. <laughs> okay, so. The title of the talk, Little Big, is inspired by a novel by John Crowley in which there are worlds within worlds, including a fairyland inside a country house. And the house's architect becomes aware of this and alludes to it in his monograph, The Architecture of Country Houses. So recently, people in exoplanets have been wishing that we have almost this book. We want the architecture of planetary systems, where architecture refers to everything you'd be able to deduce from a picture like this about the distribution and spacing of planetary orbits. So this is our solar system's architecture. And there seems to be two scales in our solar system. There's a big solar system. And then inside is a little solar system, a scaled down version. And the sizes of the orbits have some connection to the planet sizes and that all the little planets could fit inside the smallest big planet. So we wonder if other planetary systems have these multiple scales. And for most planetary systems, we don't have a picture like this. But it turns out that the two most prolific approaches for discovering exoplanets have been sensitive to two different scales of planetary systems. The first technique, the Doppler technique, uh, measures the reflex motion of the host star as it orbits the center of mass. And this technique has mostly found big planets. So this is planet mass versus orbital period. And most of the radial velocity discoveries are giant planets with relatively long orbital periods. Meanwhile, the transit technique measures uh, the dimming in a star's light as a dark planet passes in front between our line of sight. And this technique has found a lot of little planets. So here are the planet candidates discovered by the Kepler mission. This is planet radius versus orbital period. And you can see that most of Kepler's discoveries are planets that are smaller than Neptune on short orbital periods. And on this plot, the colors refer to planets that are in multiple systems. So you can see that a lot of the planets are in these very compact multiple planetary systems, systems with multiple transiting planets. Sort of an archetype example of this is the Kepler-11 system, where all five of these inner planets could fit within the orbit of Mercury in our solar system. So it turns out there are some very significant architectural differences between the big planetary systems and the little planetary systems. One is the occurrence rate. So this is the number of planets per star as a function of orbital period. And for the big planets, the occurrence rate is rising uh, within a year. And for the little planets, it flattens out beyond seven days. Another big difference is that uh, the big planets that are discovered by radial velocity have this really broad eccentricity distribution, whereas the little planets seem to have much smaller eccentricities. Hayden Lithwick recently measured an average eccentricity of 0 0.018 for uh, Kepler planets that have transit timing variations to be down here on this plot of big planet eccentricities. The same is true for the inclinations in the planetary systems. The little planets seem to be very flat planetary systems. So this is a recent study by Dan Fabricke and collaborators where they looked at the duration of planets transiting across the star and the ratio of those durations between the inner planet and the outer planet. And this tells about the distribution of mutual inclinations in the system. And the typical uh, RMS inclination is less than two degrees, so very flat like the solar system. We don't really know 
what this is for most big planetary systems. But there are some systems with big planets where people have measured the alignment between the planet's orbit and the host star's spin plane. So here is the projection of that angle as a function of the host star's effective temperature. These are all giant planets. And you can see, at least for the hot stars, that there's a big range of these spin orbit alignment angles. This distribution is consistent with being isotropic. That's at least a hint that there's systematic differences in inclinations between the big and small planetary systems. So what's the difference between little and big planetary systems? Why do they end up with such different architectures? Uh, to understand this, we want to go back to when the planets are forming. So we think the planets form in a disk of gas and dust. And I used to show this artist's interpretation. Now there's this amazing image from Alma that many have interpreted as being signposts of planet formation in these gaps. So we think that planets form uh, from an annulus of material. So here, this is the mass of the planetary embryo. And it depends on the semi-major axis and on the width of this annulus and on the surface density in solids inside the annulus. So depending on these parameters, you can end up with a different mass of the planetary embryo. So it turns out that this proceeds very differently at short orbital periods and at long orbital periods. So in the inner disk, at short orbital periods, A is small and this feeding zone is really small. So you end up with very small embryos like moon or Mars mass. These embryos are too small to accrete gas and they can't grow any bigger because the gas is still around damping their orbits and preventing the orbits from crossing. So they're sort of stuck at these small embryo stage until the gas goes away. Meanwhile, in the outer disk, this feeding zone is much larger. So you can grow an embryo that's big enough to accrete gas. And you can have an extra enhancement from the fact that when you're further from the star, uh, there are icy materials that can further enhance that solid surface density. So then you're big enough to accrete gas. And in this picture of planet formation, these big planets form farther away. And if we see any of them at short orbital periods, they must have migrated there from the further out locations where they formed. Yes? Yeah, so it depends on the surface density profile, but for most profiles you choose, it gets bigger as you go out. Yeah, only I'd say you'd have to have a pretty weird surface density profile in order for it to decrease as you go out. I haven't seen uh, anyone model a disk that way. But yeah, that would be a caveat. Um, the other difference between big and small planetary systems is how much they can stir each other up. So there's very different regimes for these little and big planetary systems. For the little planetary systems, you're in the regime where the escape velocity from the planet is a lot smaller than the orbital velocity. And so there's a limited amount that you can stir each other up through close encounters. Whereas for these bigger planets at large separations, the escape velocity is much larger than the orbital velocity. So there's no limit on how big your eccentricity and inclination can grow through stirring each other up gravitationally. So uh, in this introduction, I've talked about systematic differences between the little planetary systems and the big planetary systems. But now as I go through the main part of the talk, I'm going to be looking within each category and talking about still how this isolation mass sets a big difference in the properties and architectures of the planetary systems. So first I'm going to talk about the little planetary systems, like Kepler-11. And recall that these are the planetary systems that we thought could have formed at these short orbital periods and which have small eccentricities and inclinations. So they're flat and they're not very stirred up. Uh, one very surprising thing about these small planets is that they exhibit a very big range of compositions. So this is the planet bulk density as a function of planetary radius. 
And if we look at planets smaller than Neptune, so smaller than four Earth radii, you can see there's almost two orders of magnitude in planetary density, ranging from planets that are dense enough to be made purely of rock to those that need a low mass but large volume gas envelope to make them so puffy. So what's the difference between rocky planets and those with a gas envelope? There are probably a lot of different physical processes that are shaping this distribution, including whether the planets form from icy versus dry planetesimals, and how the atmosphere evolves through collisions, photo evaporation, or outgassing of the atmosphere. But today I'm gonna to focus on the formation stage and which planets manage to accrete a low mass envelope from the nebula. And what's the difference between planets that form rocky and those that form with a gas envelope? So let's go back to that picture of planet formation. So remember how uh, at these short orbital periods, the planets are stuck as isolation mass embryos. The orbital periods are short, so these embryos themselves can form quickly, but they're small. Remember, they're like Moon and Mars mass because they have such small feeding zones. And in order for these planets to grow any bigger, to grow to the multiple Earth's masses that we observe for super-Earths and many Neptunes, their orbits need to cross. But during this stage, the gas is still around damping the embryo's orbits and preventing orbit crossing. So we have to wait for the gas to go away before anything can happen. And finally, when the gas surface density reaches the surface density in solids, the damping from the gas shuts off, and now these orbits can cross, and you can grow a super-Earth or mini-Neptune. And it can accrete any of the little remaining gas that's still left over at this stage. So why do we sometimes get a planet with a gas envelope and sometimes a purely rocky planet. Today I'm gonna to argue that the surface density in solids in the disk plays an important role in setting this final composition. And so let me show you how things proceed differently in a disk with low or high solid surface density. Do you have some idea like what determines the separation of the isolation mass? Oh, what determines the separation of the isolation mass? Yeah, there's a couple different arguments. Um, like um, more small bodies instead of um, the U or large bodies? Yeah. Same of this um, so what sets the width of that feeding zone um, is some scaling of the hill radius, so where the planet's gravity is dominating over the star's gravity. Um, it could be a few hill radii. There's a little debate about exactly how wide it is. Um, but what, to get the hill radius, you uh, can use the isolation mass and how it scales with the disk surface density, and that will tell you how big the embryos are. So unless you have, as Jiangchen was mentioning, a really weird disk profile, you're going to end up with a smaller isolation mass at a smaller semi-major axis, and it's going to scale with the solid surface density. So if you have a low solid surface density, you're going to form a lot of little embryos. If you have a high solid surface density, you'll form more massive embryos. And also, the conclusions of different embryos can make larger planets. Do you just say because the escaping velocity from the embryo is much smaller than the optical velocity, so that the close impactor does not stir, stir the system up? So, um, I'm well, sure if you don't have enough stirring. So there's enough stirring to be to grow, uh, to become a super Earth. That's not what's limiting. Like if you use, uh, if you say you grow in the escape velocity annulus, that's fine. So the stirring is just preventing them from growing uh, in the later stage. But here, what's preventing them from growing is the gas. The gas is around damping the eccentricities, and that's why we have to wait for the gas to go right to go away from the orbits to cross. Still, the escape velocity will limit the ultimate size, but you can still, uh, there's no problem to have super-Earths and mini-Neptunes as long as the surface density in the disk is high enough. Okay, so imagine in this disk, we're trying to form a super-Earth of a particular mass, and here, with the low solid surface density, 
we need to grow from these small embryos. And here we can grow from these more massive embryos. Uh, the difference is that in this system, you're going to have to undergo fewer mergers to end up with this final super Earth mass body. And the time scale for these orbit crossings is very sensitive to the spacing of the orbits. Um, so we can imagine that the orbits start out, as Jean was asking about, spaced by a certain number of Hill radii. And let's say it's the same in the disk with the low solid surface density and the high solid surface density. So both of these, once the gas is gone, wait the same amount of time for their first orbit crossing. But then after they've had their first orbit crossing, maybe that's enough in this disk to already give you a planet that's big enough to accrete some gas. But here in this disk, you had your first merger, but you're still small. And now you're even more widely spaced in terms of the hill radius. So you have to wait even longer for your next merger and even longer for your next merger. And by time you've had to undergo all these mergers to get to this super Earth mass, the gas may already be gone. Because remember that we're already in the stage where the gas has almost gone away so that the damping has gone. And after that, at most the gas is probably going to stay around for another million years or so. So it's a race against time. And this one won the race. It grew big. It accreted the gas. But this one took too long to form. Yes? Does it believe that times like Jupiter and Saturn have to undergo one or more collision before accreting gas? Or they just do solid core accretion and put them out to um, so, so there's some debate about this. But one could argue that Saturn and Jupiter had isolation masses, embryo masses, that were already big enough to accrete gas because they need to accrete many, many times their mass and gas. So they can't uh, wait for the gas to almost go away. So these are the, pl the planets that we're talking about are ones that have maybe 1% of their mass and gas. So the gas is making a big contribution to the volume, but not to the mass of the planet, because they're already forming in this almost depleted gas disk. So what ideas like oligarchic accretion only apply for, for these larger embryos? Um, well, oligarchs, people more tend to think of as this situation, where you have one body that's dominating its feeding zone. So these embryos that you start out with could be considered oligarchs. But does that answer your question? I meant in terms of uh, the distribution of sizes that, that a given population can grow to. Is there a difference in the, in the variance of sizes between these two? Models? Oh, between these two? Yeah. Um, yes, I will get into that. Yeah, because the gas makes a big contribution to the size, even though it's not contributing much to the mass. Let me know if I don't answer your question as I go along. OK, so now I'm going to show you a few example simulations of the cores of these planets growing in disk with different solid surface density. So here are the initial isolation mass embryos. This is planet mass versus semi-major axis. And here, this black disk has a high surface density in solids. Here's an intermediate case, and here's a case with low mass embryos. So now we wait for 0.1 million years. And in the disk with the high surface solid density, already some super Earths have managed to form. Now we wait for 1 million years. Now we have a lot of super Earths in the disk with the high solid surface density. And in the intermediate case, they're just starting to get to super Earth size. Now finally, after waiting 10 million years, we have super Earths in the intermediate case, still in the lowest surface, solid surface density disk, no super Earths have formed. So this is just showing that it can sometimes take tens of millions of years to grow to a super Earth from embryo size. By then, the gas is definitely gone. Um, so I'm using a surface density profile that goes as a to the minus 3 halves. And then I'm separating uh, the embryos using, I'll just show results from. Um, it's pretty standard. We tried doing it a couple different ways to see how sensitive it was. And it wasn't too sensitive to how we uh, prescribed the initial annuli. OK, so now I'm going to show you some results from 
an ensemble of simulations. So this is the time to form uh, to be the mass at the top. So here it's one Earth mass. This is how long it took you to grow to one Earth mass uh, once this orbit crossing stage began. As a function of the solid surface density normalization at 1 AU. So these are the disks with the higher solid surface densities. And you can see that in the disk with the lower solid surface densities, you can get some very long formation time scale. This dash line is approximately like maybe how much uh, we have left for the gas to still stick around now that it's already almost depleted. And some of these are taking much longer to form than that. So there's no gas around once they've reached this mass. And whatever you choose for this mass that it has to grow to, we still see these two regimes where in the disk with higher solid surface densities, everything forms quickly while there's still gas around. But in the disk with lower solid surface densities, you can have these very long formation times where there won't be any gas left. So how big do you actually need to grow to end up with a gas envelope? Um, to estimate that, we used simulations by Eve Lee of cores accreting gas from a depleted nebula. So these are showing some tracks of the atmosphere mass fraction as a function of time. And if you want to grow to a typical 1% gas mass atmosphere, uh, it's very sensitive to the core mass. So these curves are for different core masses. And we end up with a rule of thumb that if you have 1 million years to grow before the gas is gone, you need to be at least two Earth masses. And so we took Eve simulations and painted them on to the end body simulations as the planets are merging with each other. We then have them accreting gas along these tracks. And we end up with uh, this distribution. This is the planet core mass versus the uh, solid density in the disk. And I'm color coding by whether the planet managed to accrete a 1% gas envelope or whether it remained rocky because it didn't grow the core in time to accrete any gas. And you can see there are two different regimes here. In the disks with the higher solid surface densities, everything manages to accrete a gas envelope. So these would be mini Neptune type planets with low densities. But in the disks with lower solid surface densities, we end up with a mix of rocky planets and planets that have gas envelopes. So just to get the normalization, 30 is about the minimum solar um, so it depends on the assumptions. Uh, we say that 10 is about the minimum mass solar nebula. So yeah, that's a good point. A lot of these uh, densities are a lot larger than the minimum mass solar nebula, which is where you take the planets in our solar system, their solid parts, and spread it out. Um, so that could either mean that these disks have a lot more mass than our solar systems did, or that uh, close in where these planets are forming, there's a higher uh, surface density in solids there, which could be from planetesimals drifting in um, as the star is accreting. So these, yes, these are pretty high solid surface densities, even to make a rocky planet. And how are you evolving the disk through these simulations? Are you just taking mass out of the disk and onto the planets, or is it accreting on the star? Are you going away at all? Yeah, so um, a few things to answer that. So we're working on the stage where, based on some analytical arguments, the damping from the disk is no longer important. Um, and so we're doing a simple model where the gas stays around for one million years and then suddenly goes away. In reality, it's doing something much more complicated. But this is just giving us a sense of whether the planet can possibly form in time to accrete the gas. Then for the gas prescription, um, we're saying that the gas, uh, the gas solid density, sorry, the gas surface density is equal to the solid surface density because that's what triggered this orbit crossing stage. And that's what the accretion model uses. But the accretion model is not very sensitive to the gas density. It mostly just depends on the core mass. Oh, this is from M-body simulations. So we start out with the embryos and 
uh, they're just feeling each other's gravity and colliding with each other. So it's um, it's if it undergoes a physical collision with the planet. So it, the integrator will trace the planets as they have a close encounter and see if they physically uh, hit each other. Yes? You're, um, holding out here the um, initial or the sending axis. Yes. Now you're showing some flattening it looked like with the maximum mass as a function of sending major axis in, your, in the results of your embodied simulations. Can you comment a little bit more about that or will you move will you, will you later on? Um, yeah, good question. So, let me go back a few slides. Um, so this, the color coding here is actually semi-major access. The blue points are things between 0.5 and 1 AU, and the black points are within 1 AU. Um, there are no blue points here because out here already the isolation mass is high enough. Um, we were expecting to see more of a systematic difference with some major access, but actually I do have a plot addressing this a little later. It turned out to not be super dependent, and we don't yet understand why there's that cutoff at seven days. That's something that Eve is working on, um, and it may have nothing to do with the planet formation process, um, but it does end up looking, it is consistent with a fairly flat occurrence rate as a function of some major access, but that's... I'm sorry, I'm sorry I'm seven days. Yeah, so, so, so within, the occurrence rate is flat until you get to seven days, then small planet occurrence rate drops. That's observational. Huh. Yeah, that's observational. And with the Jupiter, though, it's, it peaks a little bit closer. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's, well, there's a little debate about whether there's actually a pileup, but uh, definitely, it goes into a few days, and there are hot Jupiters on a few day orbits. Yes? Can you explain more fully what physics is in the Lee's gas aggression model? Like, what's the cleaning mechanism? Yeah, so she's doing um, hydrodynamic atmosphere snapshots that she then connects in time using the luminosity. So, what goes in there? is an opacity table um, that sets the cooling efficiency. And most of the cooling is happening, is being set by what's happening at the boundary between the radiative and convective part of the atmosphere. So it includes all the up-to-date opacities and uh, uh, transi molecular transitions that, are, that seem to be important. Um, she's run both the dust and dusty and dust-free models, and it doesn't have a big effect on these results. It does. It gives you about a factor of five difference in the accretion time scale if you do the dust-free atmosphere, which is what you might get if all the dust has sedimented to the midplane and isn't in the atmosphere. Okay, so we'd like to be able to compare this to the observations, um, but the Kepler data doesn't tell us any of the quantities on this plot. It tells us the size of the planets, and it tells us their orbital periods. So we want to have a proxy to compare. What we'd really like to be able to compare is the compositions of the planets to the Kepler data. And it turns out that we can do that because of a couple of recent developments. The first is that uh, some, this is theoretical structure models by Eric Lopez and Jonathan Fortney. This is planet radius versus planet mass. And this is a model where you have a rocky core with a gas envelope on top. And you can see that these curves are very flat. And that's because the radius is a very good proxy for the composition of the planet. And we can see that planets that are above two Earth radii need to have this 1% plus hydrogen helium atmosphere. So we can now look at the Kepler data and say that the planets that are bigger than two Earth radii uh, probably have s some sort of gas envelope. There's a couple other pieces of evidence supporting this. Leslie Rogers did an observational study of the planet, subset of planets that have mass follow-up 
mass measurements from radial velocity follow-up. And she found that there's a transition between one and a half to two Earth radii between planets that are rocky and planets that need to have a gas envelope to explain their low densities. The final piece of evidence is a study by Roberto Sanchez Ojeda of the shortest period planets, planets with orbital periods less than one day, where we expect if the planet had a very low mass primordial hydrogen helium atmosphere, it very likely would have been photo evaporated. And he found that there's a maximum size to these planets of about 1.7 Earth radii. So this supports the interpretation that all the planets that Kepler found that are bigger than a couple Earth radii have some sort of gas envelope that's contributing significantly to their volume. So we can use uh, this to link the planet composition to radius. And now, even harder, we need a proxy for this solid surface density in the disk. And this is tricky. What people usually use is the host star metallicity. And for giant planets, there's been found to be a strong dependence on the giant planet occurrence rate as a function of host star metallicity. And this is interpreted to be what I talked about at the beginning, how you need a high enough solid surface density to be an isolation mass that can accrete gas while there's still tons of gas around. The challenge with this is that, at best, this uh, metallicity of the host star is telling us about the average amount of solid content in the disk. And there can be enhancements at different radii, especially close into the star. But this is sort of the best proxy that we have, so we're going to try to use that to compare. And there is, did someone have a question? There's a recent study by Bukovian collaborators uh, that found a systematic difference in host star metallicity between the large planets bigger than Neptune and the smaller planets that are less than Neptune. And that's a pretty solid result. They also found a transition at two Earth radii that's a little less statistically significant. Um, but it's a hint that maybe metallicity is an OK proxy to be using. And so I'm going to now show you uh, what we expect from the observations based on our simulations. And then I'll show you. But also in C language, what did they find? Yeah, so they did not find this transition. Um, they found this transition between the small planets less than Neptune and those larger. But they didn't, in the latest version of the paper, see a transition at smaller radii. And then this paper said that this transition is not statistically significant. So, so you're going to use metallicity to predict radius from this? Um, we're going to use metallicity to compare uh, I don't know, solid surface density. So here, what we're predicting, actually, I'll show you more. What we're predicting is that at high solid surface density, so now it's on the y-axis, you only have planets with gas envelopes. And at lower solid surface densities, you'll have a mixture of gas planets and rocky planets. And this is also uh, addressing your question about the period dependence. It pretty much flattens out at long <coughs> orbital periods, at least in this rough way that we can look at here. And yes, so this is what we expect. We expect gas planets with the high solid surface densities, mixture with the low solid surface densities. And we're going to limit our uh, comparison to long orbital periods beyond 20 days where we don't expect photo evaporation to be important. Yes? Uh, that, that was my question. Actually, oh. Are you including photo evaporation in these plots right here? No, this is not including photo evaporation. So we're just going to compare at the long orbital periods. Yes. Um, only we don't know the masses of the planets. Well, if they're all sort of two or radii, you got a pretty good estimate. Um, so that yeah, so you're well. We would sort of expect that from the simulations. We would expect you do see a trend, a planet mass trend. Um, but these, there can be planets with different compositions with the same core mass. And those would have different radii. So we wouldn't be able to tell the difference between those and the observations. I guess more I'm saying in the system, which are higher subsets, you see more planets. 
Right, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Oh, you'd expect to see more planets. Well, only you would maybe not. You might see more lower mass planets, well, and you might not. And, low. Yeah, so what we want to compare, yeah, right, so you only, it's a little hard in that we don't, like if we see five transiting planets, we don't know their masses. It's a little hard to link that this way. I'm not sure, you know, you don't know the masses to factor, say, of two, but if there's five of them, so you've got a lot more mass than the system where there's only two transiting planets. You don't know how many, you don't know how many uh, what the true multiplicity is, because you only know the planets are transiting. Though true systematically, if there are systems with different number of planets, and you see one with a lot of transiting planets, it's more likely to belong to the high multiplicity system. Yeah, so I'll, I will think about that. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about the multiplicity later in the talk. OK. Uh, here, wait, go back. Here, yes. Minimum mass solar nebula. Or 20, okay. Um, yeah, I would expect zero ish. Like, most of these planets have probably have radii smaller than Kepler can detect. So, exactly. So, really, you're sensitive. Small range of surface because those ones have more than one planet within the range of surface two. So it's um, very small. You cannot compare this to two patches. Patches, hundreds of surface. You really compare it to a small range, right? Um, I see. I think I see. I don't know if I see. You're saying that I agree with you that at these lower solid surface densities, you're not compare. You don't have anything to compare to Kepler. These are the two things that we're trying to compare. OK. OK. So here's what we expect. And now here are the observations. So we're using the planet radius to color code its composition. So here are the pink things we're pretty sure have gas envelopes. The black, we're pretty sure, are rocky. And the blue are in that intermediate range. And we indeed see that out beyond photoevaporation, at lower solid surface density disks, or lower host star metallicity, we have a mixture of rocky planets and those with gas envelopes. And around the, disk with, around the stars with higher metallicity, we primarily have planets with gas envelopes. So then there's another way that we can compare to the observations, which is to take the uh, gas mass percentage accreted. Yes? So this sample is spectroscopic metallicities. So these are the better measured metallicities. So it's about 0.1, uh, 0.1 dec. So I'm, I plotted it in 10 to the dec, so it's a little hard to. That, that, that makes it a little hard to, put, to estimate the error. But yeah, these are better defined ones. OK, so the other way we can compare to the observations is to uh, take that percentage of uh, atmospheric gas accreted and convert it into a planet radius using the Lopez and Fortney structure models. So here are the simulations where this is planet radius as a function of the solid surface density. You can see we expect the radius to be an increasing function of the original solid surface density in the disk, and that we predict two empty wedges um, at higher solid surface density disks that there should be a lack of uh, smaller planets, and that in lower solid surface density disks, there should be a lack of big planets. And so here are the observations. Um, the air in these radii are about 20%. And you can see that we indeed see one of these empty wedges. We see this is just another way of looking at what we showed before, that at the higher uh, metallicity stars, we're lacking these smallest planets. 
What we don't see is this empty wedge in the observations. So if this is really what's happening, then there are a couple possible explanations that we thought of. Um, one is that as I talked about, this uh, metallicity of the host star is not an exact proxy for the solid surface density in the disk. And it could be that some of these disks with lower average metallicity were enhanced by radial drift and that this actually maps to something over here. Another possibility is that these are planets that formed further out and migrated in. Okay, so now we can see that even within the category of small planets, that the isolation mass made the difference between forming rocky super-Earths and mini Neptunes with gaseous envelopes. How much time do I have left? Okay, so I have like 10 more minutes. Okay, great, great. Okay, so now I want to talk about uh, the spacing of these planets. That's another important part of their architecture. So people have been trying to measure how separated these systems of small, closely packed planets are. Here's a plot from uh, Julia Fong and Jean-Luc Margot's 2013 paper. And these are all the Kepler pairs um, separated in terms of their hill radii using the colors are different assumed mass radius relations. You can see that no matter what you assume about the mass radius relation, the distribution of these peaks, of, of these spacings peaks at around 20 hill radii. And that's actually a lot wider than stability would dictate. That would be at about 10 hill radii. And so there have been a lot of interesting studies about this recently and what's affecting this spacing distribution. Um, one other challenge with this is that in simulations like the ones that I showed you where you're growing from isolation mass embryos to core masses, you often end up with wider spacings. So this distribution from simulations peaks at around 30 hill radii. So today I'm going to present a somewhat different explanation for what sets the spacing between the final planets and how we can get spacings more like 20 hill radii. So I'm going to argue that the spacing is set by an equilibrium between planets stirring each other and planets merging during this planet formation stage. And so the way to picture this is, say we have these planets on orbits that are spaced by a particular number of hill radii, and two adjacent planets will encounter each other every synodic time scale. So that's just when they pass each other. And depending on the phases of the orbit, they could either be passing each other when they're closer together or when they're further apart. If they have an encounter when they're further apart, that's going to lead to stirring. That's going to tend to increase the separation in hill radii. So there's separation that's larger. This is what's called repulsion. Meanwhile, if they encounter each other in a more closely spaced separation, then they're more likely to merge. And if you compare this more massive body's separation in hill radii to the next one over, this has decreased the separation in hill radii. So you have these balance between stirring and merging. Sir, can you be just a little bit more precise what you mean by stirring? Stirring is where you increase the eccentricity and change this to major axis. So, so nothing to do with the gas? Yeah, so this is all uh, after the gas is no longer participating. OK, so since it's all about this balance between mergers and stirring, then we have to think about what sets whether these planets merge or not. And that's going to depend on their cross-sections. The cross-section depends on a few quantities that we care about. One is the actual physical size of the planet. So if you have a puffy, low-density planet, you have a much bigger cross-section for collisions than if you have a dense, rocky planet. The stirring. Uh, sorry, the, the cross-section also depends on how flat the disk is. If your disk is flatter than the planet's physical size, that's going to enhance the merger rate. 
Whereas if you have a puffy disk, that's going to make the merger rate smaller. So these are two quantities that affect the cross section. And so now I'm going to show you some results from simulations that are similar to the ones that I showed you before, but where I assign the planets different densities or start them out as being flat versus puffy in their mutual inclinations. So here is the distri final distribution in Hill radii. This black solid curve is from a perfectly flat disk where I've given the bodies a density of one. And you can see this one peaks at about 15 Hill radii. The other set of initial conditions are using uh, random velocities that are just below the Hill velocity. So this is a relatively flatter disk, but not perfectly flat. And in those cases, if we compare the black dashed histogram to the gray histogram, which has higher density planets, there's a systematic difference between the final spacing and Hill radii. And they're both more widely spaced than this perfectly flat system. Finally, if we use the sound speed in the disk to set the initial random velocities, which is what you might expect if this is triggered by the gas damping being shut off, you can also see that there's a systematic difference between the lower density planets and the higher density planets, and that starting out with this disk, which is even puffier disk, again drives the Hill radii to larger final separations. So we think that both planet density and the initial mutual inclination in the planetary system make a big difference in the final spacing distribution. Here are some other simulations where these are ones where I also used all different uh, solid surface densities and chose ones that were made super Earths and mini Neptunes. But here, all the simulations start with the same solid surface density, but um, results in a different final inclination dispersion. So the black is a really flat system, and the red is a much puffier system. And you can see there's this systematic difference between the spacing of the planets in these two types of systems. So we can compare some other quantities that people have been interested in. Um, one interesting recent result was that Haddon and Lifwick found that smaller planets have larger eccentricities. This may seem a little counterintuitive at first, but it actually makes perfect sense if the smaller planets are the Low, are the higher density ones, the rocky ones, and the larger planets are the puffier ones, because we see that for uh, the lower density planets, which have the bigger collisional cross section, they're shifted. Um, I'm sorry, this was the wrong title. This is the. Oh no, this is right. Sorry, this is just the wrong label. I apologize. This is eccentricity. So the larger planets are shifted to smaller eccentricities. Another result that we'd like to try to explain is that Weiss and Marcy found that when they compared planets whose masses were measured using the radial velocity technique to those whose masses were measured from transit timing variations, they found that the planets whose masses are measured from transit timing variations have systematically lower densities. And planets that are, have masses measured this way need to be near a uh, mean motion resonant commensurability to get this type of signal. So if we look at the planets with a period ratio near two, so this is where we're going to get the uh, resonant effects that allow us to use this technique, we can see that the disks with, sorry, the planets with the smaller density, which means a larger cross section, have more planets um, with smaller spacing, so they're nearer to these tightly packed orbital resonances that allow us to measure the transit timing variations. Yes? I just wanted to point out, because this is really, really good. But actually, taking planet, if you don't make certain groups, but make some other groups, which are just different methods, have identical mass ratings relationship as RD, there's no difference. Well, then they have the same slope, right? But I thought the normalization was different. Okay, yeah, so actually, I, 
No, no, I agree with you. Like when I first got interested in this, I asked Joram about it, and he said the same thing. And so for a while, I believed it was purely the fact that they're using like Kepler 11 planets, for example. Like those are dominating. But still, why do the Kepler 11 planets have lower densities? Yeah, we can talk about it later. Um, but we do expect that lower that di the planets with lower densities, the more puffy planets, um, if this explanation that I give you is correct, will be more closely spaced. More of them will be near these mean motion resonances that allow you to use this mass measurement technique. Then finally, because we're almost out of time, um, people have made up this term, I think it was originally from Dong and Tremaine, called tranets. <laughs> So tranets are transiting planets um, because the number of tranets you see is not necessarily the number of planets. And so people have been trying to understand in blue the observed number distribution of tranets. And simulations like those of Hansen and Murray have found that they're not producing enough of these single tranet systems. Um, but we can see that we're still uh, trying to under trying to match the observations more carefully is that um, whether the disk is flat or puffy and the density of the planets has a strong effect on the relative number of one or two or three transit systems. And so you can see that this flat disk of planets, puffy planets, produced a lot more transits than the disks that have um, more puffy mutual inclinations and that have higher density planets. So you can see um, there are more single transits being produced by these initial conditions that are puffier and that have higher densities for the planets. Okay, I'm sorry, something got a little messed up on the legend. So now we can also say that the isolation mass is having another effect in that these systems of super Earths are more stirred and that the puffy mini Neptunes are less stirred because of this different collisional cross section. Um, let's see. So I think I'm going to end here. I'm not going to talk too much about the big planets, except to say that in their case also, um, there can be a big effect of this isolation mass on the dynamics of the system, and that systems with in higher solid surface density disks tend to be more dynamically active and lead to more uh, lead to stronger dynamical interactions among the giant planets, which I won't talk about today. But I think this is an interesting dimension to consider for what sets the architectures and properties of planetary systems. Thank you very much. Yes. So in your, one of your initial pictures, you had forming with and without an envelope, all from a single system. Do you find systems where um, some planets and systems have an envelope and some don't? Um, so generally, the planets in the same system tend to be similar sizes. Um, but there are some systems that have uh, some smaller planets and some bigger planets in the same system. Um, in some of the cases, photo evaporation might be responsible and that maybe the closer end planets have lost their envelopes. Um, but we do expect that because things are somewhat stochastic, if you're on the edge, and you, there are, should be some systems where maybe some of the planets are rocky and some of them end up gaseous. But that more generally, the planets will be similar to each other. Yes? Did you try different surface density profiles to see your effect? The abundance was pretty flat. Yeah. So we didn't explore that very thoroughly. Um, Hansen and Murray looked at that in their first paper about this. Um, that could be something interesting to look at. But everything that we did try to change what exactly those isolation mass embryos were <coughs> didn't have much qualitative effect on the final results. So one thing with that is like, uh, we chose two different sets of initial conditions, one of which was set by the random velocity 
that defines the um, annulus being set by the sound speed of gas in the disk. And that actually gives you a much weaker dependence of the isolation mass on the semi-major axis. Whereas if you use the hill velocity to set that, then there's a stronger dependence. And it never um, seemed to have a strong qualitative effect, nor did we really see a big difference in planet composition versus orbital period. So it could be that you could choose a special disk profile that would have more of an effect, um, but so far it hasn't been super sensitive to that. Yes? Just very stupid question. So you, what you show is that there's no small planets around when you start. Mm -hmm. Is it possible in some kind of setup? Because this, this planet, this radio, and this planet is really hard to find, very easy to miss that. Is it possible some kind of selection like that around that when you start? Which makes it harder to detect tiny little variations in light? Yeah, so. Yeah, we were a little concerned about that because. It is the case that the more metal-rich stars tend to be a little bit larger. So that, that makes it harder to detect a smaller planet around them. So to try to account for that, we did another, uh, I didn't show it, but we had another plot where we only included planets where you would have also been able to detect a small rocky planet if it had the same properties but was just smaller based on the uh, photometric variation of the star. And it didn't qualitatively change the results, um, though it did make the sample size smaller. So, um, right. So the the difference in the median size was about 20 percent. That translates to about a 20 percent effect on the signal to noise. Um, but they both have pretty wide ranges, and there's substantial overlap. So we don't think that's uh, what's responsible for the trend. But we would really like to visit this later now that people are trying to gather a lot more of these host star metallicities so that we can expand the sample and be less sensitive um, to these select type of selection effects. Um, so I actually, I, so I looked at their, um, their combined differential photometric provision. So that's how Kepler measures how uh, photometrically variable the star was. There actually did seem to be a little bit of a difference. Um, they did seem to be a little more active, um, which yeah. was kind of the opposite of what I expected And that I, no, it wasn't. It's that I think, yeah, that they might be a little bit younger than the more metal poor stars. And so that could be why they're a little more active. But we took that into account in our test because we used the actual combined differential photometric precision. So we accounted for the fact that they did seem to be a little bit noisier. But again, it wasn't a big effect. OK. Maybe we can continue this upstairs. Yeah. 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 Yeah.